I wanted to welcome everyone to the second of three microeconomics or macroeconomics webinars. This one addressing commodities and input prices. My name is Joanna Truitt, Executive Director for the Association Education Alliance, of which your company is a member through your association membership. Displayed are those associations that are participating in this series. Each is a member of the AEA, which is a consortium of distributor focused trade associations. I have the pleasure of introducing your presenter in this series, Alex Tchaikovsky. Thank you Alex. so much. Oh. oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to say a little bit um, about you, Alex, if you don't mind. Um, By all means. Just, yeah, I wanted to let everybody know that, you know, Alex, most of you are familiar with Alex. Um, he's highly, a uh, highly experienced market researcher and analyst with more than 20 years of expertise across subjects, including economics, industrial manufacturing, automation, and advanced technology trends. And for the last two dec decades, he's consulted and advised companies throughout the US, Canada, Europe, and South America and Asia. And he's currently overseeing a suite of analytics products um, focused on talent for the Miller Resource Group. He is also consulting with companies to help them become better at attracting and hiring and retaining the impact players for our industry. So Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. I really appreciate your introduction as always, and welcome everyone to the second installment in this macroeconomic series, where we're going to talk about commodities and input prices. This really involved a lot of research on my part, much more than typical because I don't talk about commodities on a daily basis. But I think the story that I've come up with for you today is going to be quite compelling. And at the end, I'm going to ask you to act on the information. I'm going to ask you to focus on one element of your business in particular, but we're going to save that till the end. Let's start the conversation by asking the question of why are commodities and input prices important to you as a key decision maker and a business leader? Well, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to very simple cost and the amount of funding that you have to allocate to the, this element of your business uh, in order to buy materials, in order to uh, certainly employ people, in order to uh, fund logistics and transportation concerns, and certainly uh, the cost of energy as well. So you may have seen this morning, we had the latest release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the consumer price index or the CPI as it's called. The good news was it ticked down slightly to 4.9% year over year. So the deceleration in inflationary pressure in our economy continues, but probably not as quickly as we would like it to. Uh, there are key components of that index that decline, which is good, and that's prim primarily on the energy side. We also saw the services element pull back a little bit for the third consecutive, consecutive month, which is really encouraging. That particular element, the services component, is currently the major driver of inflationary pressure, and it's because rent and mortgages are included in that. So as the payments for housing go up, that's really putting pressure on inflation. This slide right here shows you a different look at inflation, and it's called the producer price index. In this case, I'm using the final demand component, year-over-year -year growth rate, and this reflects the way that your business feels inflationary pressure. And here, the news is actually quite good. So as you can see, we hit a very high peak level above 10% back in early 2022. We've been decelerating since that point. And year over year, this dark blue line now shows that producer prices are up 2.7% year over year. When you look at it from a core basis, which excludes food and energy, you've got 3.6%. So things are normalizing. You can see that even at this level, by historic context, we're still relatively high, basically on par with mid-2018, the last time we had a business cycle peak in the U.S. industrial economy, but it's clearly moving in the right direction. So in order to figure out what's going to happen with the pricing environment as you look to the future, we have to, again, consider all of the different ways that your business costs are influenced. And of course, we have these four key elements that I mentioned earlier, the material side, which is primarily commodities, the labor component, the utilities element, which measures the cost of energy and power to your business, and then logistics, which is focused on shipping, primarily truckload shipping, which is what the distribution sector obviously relies on to get products between warehouses to end customers and so on. 
So we're going to look at each one of these elements in a little bit more detail. And we're going to start with the commodity side. I wanted to let you know about a great source of information when you're looking for data on the economy or on politics or anything like that that's really cutting through the noise and looking specifically at the data, and that's called Visual Capitalist. This slide and several of the ones I'm using today come from visualcapitalist.com. Uh, I'm giving them cr full credit for creating these, but I think that are fascinating in the way that they visualize data. For example, here, it shows you the last fully available year of all of the materials that we mine globally um, you know, for 2021, which is the last year of data that's available. And you can see here the relative scale is really massive when it comes to iron ore, the primary ingredient in steel. You can see the second and third largest categories are aluminum and copper. And so for the purpose of our conversation today, I wanted to give you some context of why I focused on steel, copper, and aluminum as the primary metals from a commodities perspective. It's really because they are one of the, some of the biggest materials that we produce and use in the industrial sector. So let's take a look at each one of these in its own right. Let's start with steel. I want you to understand, and this applies to steel and copper and aluminum as well, that at the end of the day, when, it, when you're talking about metals, it's all about China. China both produces and consumes over 50% of steel, as you can see here in the example. And that to put that in relative context, United States, Mexico, and Canada produce 6% relative to China's nearly 53%. And Europe altogether, the EU 27 countries produce just under 8% of steel globally. From a consumption basis, the use of steel materials, China is also the hegemon here. 52% of global steel uh, is used in China, 7.5% in North America, and about 8.5% in Europe, again, to put things into context. So what happens in the Chinese economy is a major driver of prices when it comes to steel of all types, cold rolled, hot rolled, uh, flat, you know, all of the different grades. It's all depending on what the Chinese economy is doing. And what we've seen is that lately there's been some concern that the post-COVID lockdown uh, recovery or rebound is not as strong as people were expecting. The latest month of data, we saw both exports and imports, imports weaker than people were hoping for. And so long term, unless the Chinese growth engine really starts to heat up, it's going to put some downside pressure on these material prices, primarily the metals. Now, moving on to copper, it's a slightly different mix. You can see here from a production perspective, China is important, but not the same as it is with steel. It's the third largest, accounting for about 8%. For copper, the largest producer is Chile at 27% of overall production, and Peru comes in at second at 10%. Uh, there, there is uh, all of the other com countries combined that are not illustrated here make up 13%, but these are the top three. When you look at consumption, though, just like with steel, China accounts for about 50% of global consumption of copper. And here you can see where the end use sectors that it's used in. Electrical products, obviously, but both transmission and distribution, as well as, th as, well as things like electric motors uh, and, and electronics of all kinds are, in, are the biggest component after telecom. Telecom is the largest at 37%. Consumer durables also make up a, a big portion. Building and construction and transport are the smaller chunks of the pie here. But again, the key focus area for me is what happens with the Chinese economy is going to drive copper pricing. Similarly, the same case goes for aluminum. So you can see here, China accounts for 57% uh, of production of aluminum. And it's very similar in terms of consumption, over 50% of the global market. The end use sectors here, building and construction is, you can see, one of the largest. Second and third are automotive and packaging. So I wanted to give you that context just so you understand, again, what goes in China de definitely kind of feeds through and affects the metal pricing on the global stage. So those three commodities, steel, copper, and aluminum, let's take a look at what's been going on with the prices there. You can see they're all on a fairly similar cycle in terms of when they rise and fall. It tends to happen in tandem because it's very supply and demand driven. And if you look towards the right-hand side of the chart, you'll see that after a period of decline over the course of 2022, we're starting to see some mild ascent in all three commodity prices. Now, uh, you can see aluminum and steel there on this axis. It's per metric ton. Copper is on this axis. It's price per pound, basically. So... 
in the short term, at least, what we're seeing is some mild ascent in these metal prices. But in the longer term context, I want you to understand it's very much tied to what happens in the business cycle, not only the U.S. business cycle, but the global one. And to illustrate that point for you, I wanted to actually plot the metals growth rates versus that of U.S. industrial production, which is what you're seeing here. So this dark blue line is U.S. industrial economy growth year over year. You can see we hit a peak in 2022 and we've been decelerating, although we're still up by a uh, kind of 3% or so uh, on an annualized basis. And that number is going to continue to slow over time. And eventually, as I shared with you uh, in the last episode, we are looking at a mild recession come the latter part of this year and in early 2024 before the next upswing starts in the second half of next year. But to put, again, the context of metals versus the industrial business cycle, I want you to see how aligned they are, how correlated they are. The lows and the highs in the growth rate of copper, for example, which is what I'm plotting for you here, align very nicely with that of industrial production. So does aluminum and steel, as you can see. So if we are expecting the U.S. industrial economy, and this is based on many different leading indicators that I track, to continue to slow and then enter an eventual recession by late this year and early next year, then what we're having to ask ourselves is, is this rising trend in commodity prices, is it going to be sustained in the near term, or is it a temporary blip before it capitulates and goes back down? In my opinion, as long as the economic weakness persists, it's going to put a lid on any further rise in prices that we see. And in particular, what we're going to be paying attention to is China, because it's going to be obviously the major driver of pricing trends for all three of these materials. Now, I didn't uh, include lumber components into uh, the webinar today, but I did just want to touch on that very quickly because I know several of your associations are involved in building materials and in the lumber sector specifically. Lumber is very correlated to single family housing starts. And what we're seeing right now is that the majority of the decline there in terms of those starts is behind us. It's not rebounding sharply by any means because interest rates remain very elevated, but pay attention to what's going on with both interest rate policy and single family housing starts because when you start to see those rise, that's going to give rise to both softwood and hardwood lumber prices as well. Shifting gears to oil and gas, another very important commodity that drives a lot of business costs. Here, the situation is quite different. So the United States is the global leader in production for both natural gas and oil, as you can see here. Again, some great visualizations from the Visual Capitalist website. Highly recommend going there. Here you can see for natural gas, the U.S. is ahead of Russia and certainly ahead of other countries in terms of output. What you can also see is that the oil equivalent here also, the U.S. leads very clearly. Saudi Arabia and Russia, which tend to be talked in kind of on a similar basis relative to the United States, are actually substantially lower in total oil output or were in 2021, which is what this data is based on. It has not changed dramatically over the last uh, two years. So you have to just understand that that's the situation in terms of production. And I believe that these really represents a lot of opportunity for U.S. distributors and manufacturers to take advantage of not only the continued dominance of the U.S. oil and gas sector, but also the opportunity that now exists for us to export both refined and natural uh, product in terms of oil and gas to the European community as we supplant Russia as their main source of energy fuels. When we look in terms of the potential that prices have, into the future, I tend to look at the Energy Information Administration, which is a U.S. government source. So you can see here the tendency for oil and gas prices is for slight rise over the course of this year before weakening mildly in 2024. Again, similar tendency and profile as what we see for the U.S. macroeconomic cycle. But there is no expectation that we have oil prices going to $100 a barrel or more based on the current landscape in this particular sector. In the natural gas side, things are slightly different. So this is the Henry Hub spot price, the main pricing element of natural gas in the United States. And you can see here, the expectations are that after a fairly sharp decline in the second half of 2022, we do have a rising tendency expected for both 2023 and somewhat 
through 2024. Natural gas is obviously a major feedstock in electricity production. It's one of the largest, if not the largest sources of fuel for a, a power generation. And so there's going to be sustained demand. Couple that with the fact that we are now liquefying it in ever increasing amounts and exporting it not only to Europe, but also to our allies in Asia Pacific and in other parts of the world. This is going to create a substantial foundation for natural gas demand and pricing. And therefore, we can see a little bit of a tendency for the cost of natural gas to edge higher, despite the fact that there's some weaker macro fundamentals in play here. I always find the uh, the connection between oil prices and gasoline prices to be really fascinating. So I wanted to share that with you today. You can see here, it's actually not a one-for-one -one correlation. The cost of crude oil actually only corresponds to about 54% of the cost of gasoline. The other components are taxes at about 16%, distribution and marketing of gas at 16%, and then refining costs at 14%. So as you can see, they're roughly the same that are not the raw material, not oil driven, but everything that has to do with refining, marketing, distribution of gas, and then of course the taxes that we pay. So when you see oil prices go down and you don't see that directly correlating it to cheaper prices at the pump, this is a major reason why, because there's a lot of other factors involved. Here, I just wanted to, th to share with you this very interesting graphic. This is the amount of materials that a person consumes in the United States on average. So you can see petroleum is a major component, natural gas, uh, again, because of the power generation, coal also coming from the power sector. And then in building materials, we actually have stone, sand and gravel and cement as the leaders. It's not aluminum, it's not copper, it's these uh, more traditional building materials. I thought that was a really interesting look once again from, from the visual capitalist. So if you haven't had a chance, check it out. It's a, it's a great source of information. I think you'll benefit from it. So to give you a general summary of the commodity side of what I've talked about is there is going to be some downside pressure just from the fact that the economic cycle is weakening and is expected to continue to do so into late this year, early next year, when we see a low point in that cycle. Once we start to see that reaccelerate, which I expect to happen probably mid next year, we're going to start to see these commodity prices edge up. So in terms of implications to you as a decision maker and a leader, understand that by the latter part of next year, your costs are going to be rising driven by commodity price increases, as long as the US economy um, you know, really goes uh, and follows its leading indicators and begins that next leg upward in the latter half of 2024 as expected. The second component I talked to you about that really drives input prices is labor costs. And so I wanted to share with you very quickly the results of the BLS's data point that came out on Friday, which is that once again, the labor market proved more resilient than people thought. We have 253,000 jobs added in the month of April relative to consensus expectations of about 185,000. So we blew that number out of the water. The unemployment rate fell to 3.4%, which marks a low last seen in 1969. And average hourly earnings actually ticked up from 4.2% to 4.4% year over year. What this means in very simple terms is that the cost of your workforce is going to continue to remain stubbornly high. And you have to allocate more money in the budget to paying your people more than the typical 2% cost of living adjustment or COLA raises that we were seeing pre-pandemic. It's got to be somewhere in that 4 to 5% range as long as these average hourly earnings numbers hold up where they are right now. Now, I do think that they're going to come down. And that viewpoint is shared by my uh, colleagues, my, my partners at Labor IQ. You've probably heard me talking about Labor IQ in the past. Their expectations is that wage growth will moderate through 2024. So it's still going to be higher than historic averages, but not as high as it was in 2020, 2021, and 2022, as you can see here on this chart. It will remain a very tight and very competitive labor market. We currently have 9.6 million job openings in the United States and only 5.7 million people looking for work. So that 4 million person gap is what's going to keep it a candidate driven market. And you really have to understand that you have to pay at market rate or above in order to be competitive. If you're not doing that, you're gonna be risk, risking the loss of both your existing talent and not being able to attract the people that you're trying to hire to fill open positions right now. 
In order to make better quality decisions about that, highly recommend that you check out Labor IQ. It's a great tool that you can use to get access to market-driven, accurate, and timely information for any number of positions. This is an example for an HR manager. You can see the median salary across the industry is about 92,000. Right now, to hire someone into that position is closer to 99,000 because of a significant shortage. So if you have access to data like this, it's going to help you make much more informed decisions in terms of your labor supply and what you have to allocate to budgeting for 2023, the rest of this year, and obviously into 2024 as well. This is very helpful for new positions. You also really need to understand where the risks are. So if you haven't done so already, you need to do a benchmarking exercise. Understand if your people are actually getting paid a fair market rate. What I've seen when I've done this for individual companies by leveraging the labor IQ data is that on average, about 30% of any given company's people are underpaid relative to today's market rates by at least 20%. And those people obviously reflect and they represent the biggest flight risks because companies are still hiring out there. You tend to hear all about the layoffs, but if you take all of the layoffs announced in the last six months, they still, the sum of those numbers are smaller than the amount of jobs we added in the month of April alone. So it's going to remain candidate driven, it's going to remain competitive, and you obviously need to plan for higher costs associated with your labor pool for the next foreseeable future. Really, I don't see that changing fundamentally anytime in the near term. We're going to wrap this up by looking at the other two components. So the, the utilities element, the cost of energy, I'm sure you felt this in your own personal energy bills, but your business has felt this as well. This is the uh, data from, again, the Energy Information Administration. This is the retail cost of industrial electricity supply in cents per kilowatt hour. And you can see how much of an increase we've seen over the last two years between 2020 and 2022. Looking out into the future, the expectation is it stabilizes around the current level. Now, what you're paying for your own energy, depending, of course, where in the country you live, is going to be substantially higher than this. You know, people that are fairly lucky to have locked in lower costs are probably paying somewhere between 12 and 15 cents per kilowatt hour for their personal use. Uh, those that are not so lucky, probably pay, paying more than 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Fortunately, because of the scale and the amount of an electricity that industrial, uh, um, the sector uses, they have much lower pricing, but you can see it is a, a, a significant increase, more than 20% increase over the last two years. That's going to abate, and we're going to see some flatness when it comes to energy costs as we look out to 23, the rest of this year, and obviously into next year as well. And then finally, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the cost of trucking. This data comes from uh, my colleague, Samantha. She's at Rocket Shipping. She's great and very knowledgeable in terms of all sorts of logistics concerns. And these are the, the, the two data series represented here are the contract and the spot pricing for uh, haul rates. And so what you can see is, yes, they are declining on an absolute basis. But what has happened is that the spot rate has declined much, much faster than the contract rate. So the takeaway here for me, if I was a business leader, is if I'm still operating under a contract that I signed sometime between 2020 and 2022, I really need to renegotiate that contract because I'm going to be able to get much more favorable rates uh, relative to what I paid at that particular point in time. And I may even consider switching over to spot pricing for the short term as I'm doing a bunch of quoting uh, you know, with different carriers because the potential savings are significant. As you can see, it's fallen from about... Uh, call it 275 to just over $1.50 for the spot haul rate, while the contract line haul rate is still above $2. So there's an opportunity for some arbitrage there. And if you do this correctly, if you actually ask for quotes, and if you uh, work with the different shippers, you're likely to find a much more preferred price on the cost of your logistics and transportation. These are the rates of change for the same data. So you can see contract rates are down something like 15% while spot rates are currently down 25%. So there's clearly an opportunity to renegotiate your uh, logistics costs and, and, and transport costs and take advantage of the decline in prices that we've seen uh, over the last, call it 12 months or so. So with that in mind, when we look at the landscape of input costs overall, 
it's a mixed bag. Materials and particularly commodities are seeing some near-term rise, at least they have over the last few months. But because of what's happening in the macro landscape, you're likely going to see them pull back and start to come under some downside pressure as the economy weakens further over the next three to four quarters. Labor costs, on the other hand, are not going to be privy to the same type of uh, dynamics, and they're going to continue to be higher in the future than they are today. So you need to be budgeting and allocating funds properly in order to, to deal with that. Leverage the decline in utilities and logistics costs. Uh, they're going to be much more evident and much more tangible on the logistics side than they are on the utility side. There's not a lot of pullback coming on energy costs. But at the end of the day, it's really important for you to manage all of these simultaneously. And I'm honestly quite shocked how often I hear business leaders talk about the last time that they did a price adjustment, because with everything that's going on, you need to be managing your profitability at all times. And it can't be just done at the top level of your business. It needs to be done at the product line level and it needs to be done at the customer level. So if you have not assessed how profitable each of your main customers are and how profitable each of your product lines are in the last 12 to 18 months, absolutely imperative that you do so in the near future. So with that, I wanted to make sure that we have plenty of time for uh, discussion today. Uh, I'm going to open it up to some questions. And by the way, here is a, a QR code for my LinkedIn page. Please feel free to connect with me. I'm always happy to engage in one-on-one -on -one conversation as it pertains to your specific business. So I look forward to connecting with all of you. And if there are any questions, Joanna, I'm happy to take some now. Yep, we have uh, two of them, actually. Okay. The, Fed was, uh, the first one um, uh, indicates the Fed was wrong about transitory price inflation. However, what do you think the chances of the economy going into a deflationary period as supply and demand come back in the balance? Is that also a risk? Yes. So I think the best way to answer this question is to talk about the difference between disinflation and deflation, right? So disinflation is when you have a slowing tendency to price increases. That's what I think is the likeliest uh, probability as we move forward is that inflationary pressure will continue to recede, but it's not going to turn negative, which means prices are actually falling, which is what deflation is. So I think we have to continue to prepare our businesses to grapple with higher costs in the future. I just don't think that those increases in costs are going to happen at the same pace as they did in 21 and 22. And they're going to be much more manageable, but it still involves your uh, homework and a lot of effort on your part to maintain that profitability, to have the tough conversations with clients that you find are behind in terms of where you need them to be from profitability perspective and to uh, unfortunately, to be willing to walk away from some clients that you find are not willing to play ball and are costing you business, you, you money in the long haul. Remember, you are not in business to just grow your top line. You're in business to make a profit. And if you're not doing so, then you have to be willing to walk away from those clients. So I hope that answers your question. The other question is, what trends do you see in labor participation rate? The labor participation rate has actually been increasing in the last several months, which is a positive. I think the question of why is hap that's happening is, is an important one. And I think there's a lot of different things involved there. So one of the things is obviously as inflation remains elevated, people are struggling to maintain and to keep up. And so we're starting to see some people come back into the labor force just because the cost of life continues to increase and whatever mechanism they had in place for paying for previous costs is no longer enough to sustain them in this higher inflationary environment. We're also seeing some uh, uh, indication that the government is going to end its student loan moratorium. And so those payments are about to start up again for a lot of people. That's going to drive people to want to come back and, and find sources of income to maintain uh, you know, their financial viability as they deal with this cost that they haven't had to deal with over the last three years, really, be, since the pandemic started. Uh, I think that there's also elements in terms of, you know, 
the funding has run out, the savings are cl are clearly uh, depleted, the, the amount of money that people were able to save up in 2020 and 2021. That's adding some urgency for people to co go back into, into the labor market. And just the general uncertainty surrounding what's happening with the economy. So, uh, you know, many people constantly hear the word recession and are getting more and more concerned. And so that's uh, really driving some of that um, you know, need in order to protect yourself, to play it safe a little bit. And I think that's what's causing that labor participation rate to tick up. Uh, I think that that's going to continue as long as the macroeconomic environment weakens. Um, so for the foreseeable future, I'd expect it to continue going up. Another question is, are you seeing a similar trend in fee shipping to trucking? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, what kind of shipping were you asking about? Uh, sea shipping? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, there the trend is actually much more uh, uh, intense in, in, in the, the pullback in prices. So, uh, you know, during the, the, um, the supply chain crisis, if you will allow me to call it that, of late 21 and uh, the, the first half of 2022, before we started to see some, some normalization of things, uh, shipping rates, uh, seaborne shipping rates were absolutely through the roof. So uh, I heard uh, from many of my clients that getting a container from uh, China to the West Coast of the U.S., whether that's uh, Santa Barbara or um, LAX, uh, was was really uh, like five or six x what it used to cost before the pandemic started. Uh, getting something to Europe was three to four x. Now those prices have come down and are much more in line with the typical shipping rates that we see for transatlantic and transpacific seaborne trade. What I will also say is that during that. Uh, that squeeze, the, the supply chain squeeze, um, we, we saw a huge amount of orders being placed with carrier builders uh, for new ships. And a lot of those ships are starting to enter the market in 23, and they're going to continue to enter the market in 24, 25, which means that spare capacity is about to go absolutely insane in terms of the volume of increase that we're going to see. That should continue to put downside pressure on seaborne shipping rates. And I believe that that trend is going to continue. So you should see cheaper seaborne rates as we look out towards 24 and, and even into 25 and 26 as well. Another question is, do you foresee any economic impacts of the emerging AI technology entering the marketplace? This is a, a terrific area of discussion. Of course, there's going to be impact. As with any technological breakthrough, that impact is likely going to be very disruptive and is going to be disproportionate in the way that it affects uh, people and companies. And you know, you talk about the difference between blue collar and white collar. There's all sorts of fear, fear mongering going on out there that you know, 80% of white collar workers are going to lose their job to AI. I don't buy into that. Every time we've seen this technological leap forward, and you're talking about the, you know, going back to the 90s with the internet, then with smartphones, uh, you know, certainly with the 3D printing and other things like that, it has not been a economic destructive force, but rather an economic creative force. Now, certainly there have been shifts that have got, happened as a result, new industries being created, new jobs being created. And long term, I think that generative AI whether it's ChatGPT or the thousands upon thousands of other platforms that are being developed right now, it seems like every company, whether it's a technology company or uh, a well-known brand in the consumer packaged goods space is working on some sort of AI development. I don't think it's going to destroy the economy. I think it's going to evolve the economy as previous technological leaps forward have in the past. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen. But So I do think that for every business, you need to have a sit down and a very frank discussion of what are the vulnerabilities and what are the opportunities that we see for our business relative to generative AI. And then figure out how to capitalize on the opportunities and how to mitigate those threats because if you don't do it, then one of your competitors will and you'll be left behind. So look forward to the future with optimism. I'm a big believer that we're gonna figure this out. There's lots of data that exists, for example, that the vast majority of the jobs of the 2030s don't even exist yet. And although that's difficult to fathom, I can only look back at 2007, which is the year that the iPhone was introduced, and entire industries, for example, you know, the, the, the higher on-demand transportation like Uber and Lyft, that didn't exist before the iPhone. 
And it seems like it's such a vital and integrated part of our day-to-day -day life now um, that in, in net, of course, that has been a very positive transformation for individuals and for the US economy. And I believe generative AI will do the same. Another question has to do with the used housing market. Um, the question is, do you see the lack of used housing stock for sale as the primary driver for new home construction? Yes, absolutely. That's a very simple question to answer. We do not have enough houses for sale. Uh, there's there's two elements that, that go into answering that question. First and foremost, we have not been building enough houses since the Great Recession of 0809. The typical annual home construction rate pre-Great Recession was something like 1.6 million units a year. And we only recently got back to a million units a year. So we now have almost two full decades of building houses at a below necessary rate relative to what demand supports. The other element that we have going on here is that people are being locked in to moving out of their home and making it available for somebody else to buy because of the interest rate environment. So imagine if you have a three, three and a half, or even a 4% mortgage, you're not likely to give that up to go somewhere else and take out a mortgage at six and a half or seven percent. And so it's creating this artificial constriction in the availability of used homes that is obviously driving a lot of the pricing activity in the market and is, is certainly going to be problematic for us for quite some time because there's no easy fix. Most of the new construction that's been going on has been focused on multifamily housing rather, rather than residential housing. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be an issue that's going to be difficult for us to overcome. And the only way that I see us really coming out of that is somewhat of a normalization of interest rates. We talked about that quite a bit during the last uh, episode. We have expectations, as clearly stated by the Fed, that in the longer term, so the next two to three years, they are going to be normalizing the federal funds rate back down to the typical two and a half to three percent level. Whether or not they're actually able to accomplish that it remains to be seen. But if we can get mortgages to come back down into even the four to five percent rate, then there's going to be a lot more used housing inventory that opens up because people will be more willing to leave the house where they're currently living and go buy another house, an upgrade perhaps. Another question is, are there segments of the economy that don't expect to see recessionary performance like industrials? Yes, yes absolutely. There are segments. Um, I would say that there are always counter cyclical industries that exist relative to what happens to the general business cycle. A great example of what one right now is the military and defense space. So, um, you know, typically, uh, what we see is when industrial activity slows, uh, you know, the, the business cycle in the U.S. starts to decline. Uh, actually, and, and we see this going on right now, military and defense spending, whether that's by the U.S. government or in terms of export activity. As I'm sure you are not, will not be shocked to find out the world is a crazy place today. U.S. military gear, especially in light of what's going on in Ukraine, is seen as superior to any of the other countries. It is the number one wish list of the countries in the Middle East uh, and certainly other growing states like India and so on. And so we are exporting a great deal of military and defense equipment, and that's driving an accelerating rising trend in the defense sector. So if you're able to find some customers and develop some products that will allow you to leverage the growth in that space right now, that's a great way to offset some of the downside pressure you'll be feeling from some of the more traditional industrial sectors that you may be participating in. And another, there's another question related to housing. Um, are greater interest rates and banking failures going to greatly impact multifamily housing construction? Well, yes, uh, I would say, but not in the same way. So uh, what you see going on in terms of the interest rates, let's, let's talk about mm -hmm. that first. It's very much connected to the bank failures that are happening. Uh, so we'll talk about Silicon Valley Bank as, a, as an example, the, the first of the major failures, right? The reason why that bank failed is because of the investments that they were holding at the time. So most of the banks buy long-term government bonds uh, because they're very safe securities. They typically come with a guaranteed uh, coupon payment. And if you hold that bond to maturity, you're definitely going to get all of your money back. What tends to happen during a period of uh, aggressive rises in interest rate is the value, the paper value 
of the bond declines as interest rates go up. Because if someone can buy a bond with a much higher rate, then the one that you have with a lower rate is worth less money. So that bank got squeezed from two sides. Number one, on paper, they had massive losses because they had too many long-term securities that were losing money uh, due to the rising interest rate environment. The second thing that happened is they had a run on deposits. And so they were forced to sell those securities, recognize the losses, and then simply didn't have enough money to pay all of their creditors and debtors and depositors. So if they were able to hold all of that, uh, that debt to its full maturity, which typically is somewhere between eight and 15 years, then you would have been fine. But the combined effect of very rapid increases in interest rate policy, plus the run on the deposits at the bank, forcing them to sell all of those bonds at a loss is what really did SVB in. So to connect all of that to the uh, multifamily market, I think it's much more dangerous in the commercial real estate space rather than the multifamily space. Because multifamily space, we talked about the demand is absolutely there, right? So as people can't afford to buy standalone single family homes, the only other real option is rental or you know, multifamily housing. In the commercial market, we have vacancies rate that remain very elevated, particular in big urban centers. And many of the banks that hold those commercial loans are coming under similar stress. And so they're going to be much less likely to fund future commercial activity. Therefore, it's going to constrain the amount of commercial building that's going to happen. On the multifamily space, we've seen it be very, very resilient, even during a period of time when single family housing has been in decline, both in terms of permits and construction, the multifamily space has been healthy. Now, I think it is important to recognize that they tend to lead the economic cycle. So it wouldn't be surprising at all if we saw a bit of a weakening in that space, but I don't expect the same kind of negativity as what we've seen in single family housing and certainly not the same kind of uh, real crisis, for lack of a better word, that we're going to see in the commercial real estate market. And we'll do just one more question. Okay. Um, thoughts on the debt ceiling discussion and what the impact might be? Well, I got to tell you, uh, fool me once, you know, shame on <laughs> you. Fool me twice, shame on me. How many times have we had this conversation? Do we raise the debt ceiling? Do we not raise the debt ceiling? The reality is they have no choice. They cannot default on the debt. It would be catastrophic. So they're going to give concessions. The left will give up something. The right will give up something. Eventually, they will come to some sort of agreement and they will pass a new, a new higher limit on our debt ceiling and things will go back to normal. But it seems like we've heard the song before, right? It's, it's almost like it plays on repeat. Um, very much politicized, obviously. And I'm not blaming the left or the right, particularly for this. Everyone's to blame. And let's just get it done with and move on with our lives. That's perfect. In all honesty, I think that's a, a good place. <laughs> it's a good place to end. Um, and that was not, not a political statement by any means. It's just, <laughs> a, 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 there are so many no, bad no, things. You're right. Yep. There's so many real things that we as individuals and as business leaders should be paying attention to that stuff like this, that's just noise and very political in nature, really, we don't need any of it, right? We need to just be able to focus on the things that matter, make those key de decisions for our personal lives and our businesses, and, and, and do the best that we can to move forward in this uncertain environment. Perfect. Well, Alex, again, thank you. Um, as always, great information you provided today. Uh, we wanna thank everyone who was on the call for your participation and the great questions. Um, tomorrow, your association will be receiving a link to the recording for their web uh, of this webinar. Uh, so if you missed anything, or if you'd like to go back and re-listen, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, we do um, hope you plan on joining us Wednesday, June 14th for the last webinar in the series, um, B2B, CapEx, Inventories and Investment Considerations. So uh, until then, please take care. Thank Thanks you. so much, Joanna. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.